Today I'm going to deliver on a promise. We talked about kinematics. That's the study of motion, displacement, velocity, acceleration, etc. And I promised at that time that we would talk about the forces that create this motion. And today we deliver on that promise. So just as a review, the kinematics deals with these, the displacement, velocity, and acceleration. We've talked about that in chapters 2 and 3. And starting with this chapter, chapter 4, we'll talk about the forces uh, that create this motion. So for example, this uh, water skier, um, there are several forces acting on him. But one is the force of the rope pulling him as he goes around the turn. So first of all, concepts of force and mass. So let's define a force. The force on an object, it might seem like kind of a funny definition, but it's a push or a pull. It's something that, that is trying, to, trying to, to move an object. And of course, if you push on a wall, the, object's not, the wall is not going to move, but it's still a force. So it's a push or a pull that may or may not cause the object to move. And it's, it's a vector. So we're going back to chapter one and our study of vectors as we describe forces. And the magnitude of the vector is measured in a, a unit called the Newton. And, um, and the direction of the force is the direction of the push or pull. So if I'm pushing on a wall this way, then that force is in the direction of that push that I'm pushing against the wall. Net force. What's a net force? Very important concept. The net force on an object is the vector sum of all of the forces acting on it. So if you remember when we talked about vectors, um, if we had a vector like this and a vector like that, if we wanted to add them, then we would take this second vector and put its tail at the head of the first vector. And then there might be other vectors that we add up and to find the resultant vector. So in chapter one, we called, the resultant ve we called it the resultant vector when we added up several vectors. In chapter four here, the, res the resultant vector is called the net force when you're adding up force forces. So the net really means resultant. And um, it's the vector sum of all of the forces, and it's denoted by this uh, combination of symbols. The uh, boldface F with an arrow over the top, that means force. And this symbol here is a Greek letter. It's a capital sigma. And normally in physics, that symbol is used to represent sum of. So it's really a sum of forces. Adding up all the forces, a sum is an adding. So this is, this is what we, uh, how we denote the net force. So we'll be talking about two different kinds of forces. You don't need to remember these distinctions, but just so you understand uh, what types of forces we'll be dealing with, we'll talk about contact forces, like uh, the normal force of me pushing against a wall, like te tension in a string, like the, the um, water skier and the rope pulling on him. That's a, called a tension force. It's a force exerted by a rope. Um, and friction, uh, things moving against each other. Those are contact forces. They require some kind of contact between the, the object exerting the force and the uh, object experiencing the force. There are also accident, action at a distance forces, like gravity. Well, the, the, the sun exerts a gravitational force on the, on the Earth, but they're not in contact. Electrical forces are another example of that. So the net force, as I said, a very impor important concept. Um, once you're getting the handle of the net force, then you'll start to be able to, to get a grip on Newton's three laws, which is really the essence of this. Um, getting a really strong handle on Newton's, third law, Newton's three laws that we'll talk about in the next few sections, it requires some, some brain power and some practice to get it right. Um, 
So the net force, this is just a repetition of what we did before. The net force on an object is the vector sum of all forces acting on that object. No big deal. Uh, it's a resultant force. Arrows are used to represent forces, and the length of the arrow is proportional to the magnitude or the strength of the force, just like we talked about in chapter one. So if this is a, a 10 Newton force that's acting on this box toward the right, and this 4 Newton force is acting on the box toward the left, then we try and make the, the length of the arrow at least approximately proportional to the strength of the, of the force. This one has a strength or a magnitude of 10 Newtons. This one has 4 Newtons, so we draw a shorter vector arrow for that. So what's the net force then? Well, if you push to the left with a, a force of 4 Newtons and push to the right with a force of 10 Newtons, then the net force is just going to be 6 Newtons, the difference between the two. And it's going to be in the direction of the stronger of the two forces. No big deal. What if you push to the right with 4 Newtons and you push to the left, or you push up with 3 Newtons? What's the net uh, force? Well, you've got to add these two vectors together. Yeah, you put the tail of the second vector at the tip of the first vector. So here's another copy of that 3 Newton force. And then you draw the resultant vector, or in this case, the net force from where you start in this journey to where you end, the straight line distance from where you start to where you end. And some of you might remember that a 3, 4, uh, a triangle with two uh, sides, one being three and one being four, has a hypotenuse that's five newtons. And you can verify that with the Pythagorean theorem. And you can also calculate uh, the angle of the, of the force. I'm not going to go through that. You can take the inverse tangent, et cetera, et cetera. But the net force is this vector right here. So what direction is it in? Well, it's directed. Um, its magnitude is 5 newtons, and it's directed 64 degrees um, vertically upward from the direction to the right, or the x-axis. Inertia and mass. The inertia of an object is its resistance to changes in velocity. And I'd like to make sure that you understand that this, it's not resisting velocity. It's resisting changes to the velocity. What do I mean by, what do I mean, what do I mean by that? Um, if it has no velocity and I want to give it some velocity by pushing on it, the inertia is its resistance to, st to, to start moving. That's the inertia. But if it's already moving, it doesn't want to change its velocity. Its inertia is a resistance to, to speeding up or slowing down. So it's a change in the velocity. And you might say, well, isn't that just the acceleration? And I say, yeah, it is. A change in velocity is an acceleration. And so another way to think about it is that the inertia is its resistance to acceleration. So the inertia of an object reflects the amount of material in an object. The bigger the object, the bigger its resistance to changes in its velocity. If you've got a big old stone here um, and you push on it, it's going to resist uh, changing its velocity from zero to something finite. Compared with if you have a fly or whatever, a very uh, uh, low mass item, it'll be easy to change its velocity. So the amount of material in an object uh, is reflected in the inertia as well. And the inertia is measured by the mass. And that mass is measured in kilograms just as we talked about um, when we talked about units from chapter one. Uh, one example is um, seatbelt mechanisms. So in a seatbelt mechanism, you want the seatbelt to protect you in the case of an accident, but you, want, you don't want it to restrict you when there's not an accident so that you can move forward with the, the, the chest belt that comes around you and check something out of the glove box, et cetera. So, there's this mechanism with this gray-shaped um, T uh, piece of metal pivoted here that just hangs straight down normally while you're driving along in a car. When you uh, slam on the brakes, 
if you're moving in this direction and you slam on the brakes, then everything is going to, well, you're moving along this way, you slam on the brakes, everything's going to want to kind of go forward. And so this pendulum swings forward and it trips this uh, locking bar, raises it on one side and lowers it on the other side, and that locks with the um, ratchet wheel on the, on the um, seat belt. Pretty cool, huh? But that requires an acceleration, and that acceleration, the change in the velocity and an inertia, which causes that pendulum to swing forward. Uh, masses. A penny is about a very small uh, amount of kilograms. A book, that's a couple of kilograms or so, just to get a handle on it. We showed in the video from chapter one, we showed uh, a one kilogram mass. A book is a couple of kilograms. Uh, super tanker, 10 to the eighth kilograms, et cetera.